so far from the ground, but I'm not looking down. Lovers and lurkers, thank you so much for coming to hang with Hillary. I'm Hillary Scarl, and let's give a roaring welcome to my co-host David Maldo. Hey everyone, welcome to Wednesday, the best day of the week. I am so happy you are here. We have a <laughs> crowd. <laughs> we oh, and you changed your shirt. I really like your shirt. You did and nice. And your hair. Sorry, nurse. Where's the purple? The purple is out. It's purple's out. We went with red. We're red today. Oh, okay. All right. I thought I it was, was going for a. Uh, I was going to just go dark with a little subtle highlights of red, but it didn't quite turn out that way. Oh my God! See, that's how oblivious. I'm so sorry. I didn't notice during our tech. I see it now. Now that you've pointed it out, like many things in my life, <laughs> it takes a moment. <laughs> But then I catch up and see. Uh, if you are tuning in for the first time, welcome, welcome. We are here every Wednesday, 5 p.m. Pacific, uh, every 8 o'clock Eastern. And we're talking to artists, actors, directors, filmmakers, choreographers, stylists about the journey of being an artist. Uh, I feel like my career has twisted and turned, gone backwards, forwards, sideways, and other dimensions unplanned. And I love hearing stories of my friends, my colleagues, people who inspire me and hearing their journeys and hopefully get to inspire people about their journeys as well. So that's the point why we're doing, we've been doing this since January. This is episode, what episode are we? 15-ish? 15 15-ish, 15 yes. We've had a few, um, yeah, we've had a couple of false starts, but I'd say 15 sounds like a good number. It's, we've been holding our own. Yeah. And, uh, oh, and you wanna absolutely subscribe because we have some fabulous guests coming up. Next week, April 24th, producer Susan Diner is gonna come in, uh, talk about her producing work and also uh, her involvement with the Magic Castle. On May 1st, we've got writer extraordinaire Stephen Banks, who is the head writer of SpongeBob SquarePants, and he's oh, got some oh. treats in store for you. And on May 12th, we've got John McGinty with our fabulous sign language interpreter, Julie, who will be back to make the show accessible. And he'll be talking about his journey as a deaf actor on Spring Awakening on Broadway. And uh, I'm sorry, he did Hunchback of Notre Dame. So I'm getting my actors confused, but John will be here on May 12th. So we've got a pretty good lineup going on. <laughs> so I'm pretty proud of that. But tonight's guest, I'm so happy, made it back to the show. We had some technical difficulties. So uh, I'm so happy because we had the show planned and it's, I think you guys are going to really like it. Uh, so without any further ado, let's bring on my friend, Fangoria writer, Pat Jankowitz. Hey. Oh, by the way, I'm in the green room. You guys are out of green M&Ms. <laughs> uh -oh. That's trouble. Yeah. My writer specifically stated. You're going to have to bring that, take that up to your agent, Pat. Thank you. The production manager. Well, I'm beyond honored to be on the show, kids. How are you two? Oh, my good. gosh. Thanks for We're being here. We're good. Uh, for people who don't know, Pat was actually the one who named the show. When I was spitballing ideas for a show, it was actually, you were the one who said, you know, you have to call it Hanging with Hillary. So Perfect. 
It makes sense. Right? It's the only thing that makes sense. <laughs> I've got people in my life who name things, and you are one of them. So I I'm appreciate honored. it. <laughs> I've renamed your dog as well. Oh, Charlie Kai's going to be sad. She's chippy, though. Yeah. <laughs> We'll have to run that by Charlie. Charlie makes those executive <laughs> decisions. Uh, so Pat and I met years ago at our mutual friend, Rosie Macedo's party. And I am not very Hollywood for anyone who knows me. It intimidates the hell out of me. But Rosie made me and a bunch of guests feel welcome. She had this gorgeous home um, under the Hollywood sign and would invite the most incredibly eclectic crowd of writers, filmmakers and scientists so <laughs> we had no rosie's got one foot in it. And, and rosie is one of the smartest coolest people i've ever met you know and Same. yes rosie has connected me to many many uh she introduced me to jeanette um win who was also on hanging with hillary so uh -huh. i found jeanette through rosie and so yeah so hopefully after the pandemic uh yeah that's a pretty special connection. Um, all right, so I'm going to read your bio now, Pat, and feel free to interject or correct because this was done. Try to stay awake during the slow parts, gang. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so Pat Jankowitz hails from Detroit, Michigan, and is known for his work as an actor on Tim and Eric's awesome show, Great Job. Great title. <laughs> Also, the Eric Andre show, The Rundown, K Pax, and The Prey. He is the brother of Steve, Diane, Don, and Tom Jankowitz, who wrote Gross Point Blank. Pat is a very tall man coming in at six foot nine inches. Oh, That's six nine <laughs> in American terms. How many meters is that for our UK friends? Oh, yeah. How many stone? Um, you have to ask a Canadian or a Brit. I have no idea. They tried to, growing up in Detroit, they tried to foist the metric system on you. I remember they, Mr. Metric. They would, the teacher in like like uh, fourth grade would try and bring in Mr. Metric. Nobody, it never took. You know, I have to tell every one of my British editors, sorry guys, I speak English. I can't, I can't do the metric system. <laughs> no metric. All right. So uh, to be continued, uh, Pat is an actor, author, and he is an encyclopedic film junkie and journalist who has written for Fangoria, Star Trek, the magazine, Star Wars Insider, the last issue of Wizard, um, who, that the editor went on to work for Robot Chicken. So he was- Yes, very good. I just saw him at the uh, at the 150th episode of Robot Chicken. It was really nice to thank the guy. Wizard, Wizard gives you instant nerd credibility. It means nothing to you, Hillary. And Dave, I'm not sure if you're a comic book reader, but if you're a comic book reader, it's like a stoner kid will always recognize Tim and Eric. And you know, you'll get stopped anywhere for Tim and Eric if it's a stoner kid. But if it's like a comic book nerd and they hear wizard, you've got their undivided attention for at least 10 minutes. <laughs> I feel like we could just read your bio for the whole show and then we can go into story. <laughs> I want to ask you questions though. All right, wait, we're not done with your bio about. yet. And, and and I'm hoping that like uh, David's prediction comes true that like uh, many, many months in the future when we have people watching older shows that I will find our, our genre and horror people of the future watching. Thank you, future audience. We appreciate you and happy you found us. Let us know if there's flying cars yet. So, um, <laughs> all right. So Pat has interviewed big celebs. He's, he's interviewed Nicolas Cage, Natalie Portman, Charlize Theron, Christian Bale, Christopher Nolan, James Cameron, Ray Bradbury, Vince Gilligan, and was named one of Stan Lee's top 10 interviews ever. So I feel very happy about that. All right, we got through the, we got through the bio. <laughs> oh, perfect. I want to know though, and by the way, good to see you, Dave. You look great. Good to Thank see you, you Hillary. Right? There we go. I've got this uh, CG stuff down pat. Okay, here's what I want to know. I want to ask- Wait, 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 wait. We're not, we're, we're, we have to show oh. your books before we go oh, into no, me. Uh, so David, <laughs> if you can find- thank you. You're All right. a job pimping it than I am. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got, uh, Pat has written three books, uh, The Buck Rogers, and you said something during our tech check about Buck. I was nominated, uh, I did the commentary for The Buck Rogers on Blu-ray, the complete collection, Kino Lorber, and we were just nominated for a Saturn Award, which is like kind of a, a don't, don't hold this against me nominating committee, kind of a nerd Oscars, which is kind of cool, the Saturn That's Award. That's very cool. You know. 
So that's Buck Rogers. He's also wrote uh, Just When You Thought It Was Safe, a Jaws companion. So can we pretty much say that this is the definitive book on Jaws and you pretty much know all there is to know about Jaws? I cover all four movies. I, 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 to me, everybody would pretend Jaws was made and that was it. But there were three sequels of Declining Value that no one ever talks about. So my book was to go up in the attic, kick open the attic door, and meet the crazy ants of the Jaws franchise nobody ever talks about. Wow. So yes, if you want to know about all four Jaws movies, my book is the only place to go for this. How did you, how did you first get interested in Jaws? How did... Like what was it, what did you see it? And it was one of those films that changed your life or you just found a whole wealth of information that you felt like needed to get out into the world? I was, I was kind of a squeamish kid. I was scared of, uh, of a lot of stuff. I, when I was three, my big brother and my uncle were gonna go through a haunted house at the Michigan State Fair and my brother chickened out. <laughs> and I went through it with my uncle when I was three. So it freaked me out. So I was scared really easily after that. And Jaws was one of those movies I was too young to see and my mother banned me from seeing it. I'd never been banned from seeing a movie before. <laughs> and so now I'm, you know, once your mom tells you, oh my God, it's too scary for you. Then you start wondering, is it too scary for me? Can I not take it? And it was one of those movies, I, the movie was a huge hit. It was released like a hundred times. Mm -hmm. So I went to one of the later re-releases, you know, as a kid and we saw it at the drive-in and, you know, it was mind blowing. So it, it always had this banned fruit, you know, the forbidden fruit thing to it. You know what I mean? I mean, mm -hmm. and so when I was writing, when I was writing professionally after that, nobody would ever bring Jaws up, you know? And I mean, it, it was never referred to, it was never talked about. And I just decided since the horror magazines didn't consider it horror, they would ignore it. I worked, I worked with publicity at Universal Studios. They didn't consider it horror. And it really weirded me out that nobody ever talked about the movie. I mean, it's the, it was the highest grossing horror movie and the highest grossing movie of all time. No one ever brought that up. Is that and right? I, more than Avatar, more than, or at the time? Way, and by the way, it beats all of those in modern dollars. It made, wow. that, it made that money in old money, you know, and money was money, not not in today's market with pay-per-view and everything else. Mm -hmm. It was literally, it was one of those movies you saw it at the drive-in or something and it haunted you. And I just, it bothered me that nobody ever talked about it or, or then you'd see a really good book on it. You know, the Brits love Jaws. They've done books and, and there's a great site called The Daily Jaws that devotes a lot of time to discussing it. But yeah. they never talk about the sequels. And I mean, the shark swam to Florida to eat the last member of the family. That happened, man. I saw that movie. Nobody ever talks about it, but oh, it happened. Wow. <laughs> That's an incredible journey through Jaws. I, 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 I can't, I have not read it yet, but I, I am very excited to learn more. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, okay, we've got one more book. Uh, we've got a uh, Hulk companion you wouldn't like me when i'm angry biggest um, book i ever wrote two pounds you know the, this one is the this book was like vietnam getting out of this book was it was this book was a land war in asia okay this was not a book i mean and by the time you're so far in you can't see shore you can't see the end of the book and you keep finding people and you keep getting running into people this book, I remember thinking at like three in the morning one night, I don't know who this book is for. You know, it was, it was such a huge book. It was covering the TV movies, the Hulk movies, the creation of the character. I couldn't, you and I talked about this because you went to the same thing on one of your documentaries. Yeah. And I remember at three o'clock in the morning on a Sunday night, and I just, I wanted to cry because there was no end game. I, I was, I... It was supposed to be an episode guide, but then there was, they did all these TV movies before and after, and they did, I couldn't find a, a stopping point. And I remember thinking, I remember thinking there's no audience for this book. Nobody gives a damn, but I can't finish it until I finish it. Right. And a friend of mine, I guess Family Guy, the show Family, 
Lonnie Ferris Knoll is a friend of both of ours, I believe. Yep. She posted the opening credits from that night's episode of The Incredible of Family Guy. And they did a parody of the opening credits of The Incredible Hulk. And I remember thinking that became my lighthouse. That helped get me. And I thought, nice. I don't know Seth MacFarlane, but I'm running the book for him. <laughs> I love it. So how long did it take you to finish the book? It was nine to 11 months. And and every time I tried Oh, to you made it sound like it was years in the works. That's... That, but, the, but Hillary, that's the thing. I mean, when you're... When you, I was referring to... When I broke in, I would do interviews. And if, if I wrote for a lot of Star Trek magazines. And if you grab somebody from Star Trek and they had any Incredible Hulk credits, you would put them into the interview. So you would be uh, floating with, you had people from the get-go. Right. And there's a lot of people who were involved. Unfortunately. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, 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 you no, know, it, it, it becomes this whole rabbit hole you go down. And then, and then you'd find out some terrible story behind the scenes. Bill Bixby's life became the show. Bill Bixby's, uh, Bill Bixby got this bad divorce. His child died, and and, and wow. he was blasting his wife, his ex-wife, in the press, and she killed herself. This is a whole. This is the the middle chapter on the life and death of Bill Bixby became a book unto itself. Yeah, and I mean, I'm, it was weird because you'd be interviewing some actress. I was interviewing, I got Lonnie Anderson for the book, Lonnie Anderson, and Lonnie Anderson starts crying during the interview talking about Bill Bixby. And I'm, and I'm like, I suddenly realized this is a much deeper book yeah. than I was, you know what I mean? I mean, it's people's lives. Yeah. 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 And it, it was something like that, that would pull you out of it. And then you would meet somebody, you would meet a Marion Hartley, or you would meet a Patrick Boy Riven or, or, or Kenny, or Kenny Johnson. And they, you would go, I, I found myself writing two books, the, this profile of Bill Bixby, the Lonely Man chapter, which is, you know, that was the, the hardest thing I've ever written is this 20 page section on him, as well as trying to give everyone else the meat and potatoes of the book and what would happen here and there and everywhere, you know. Does that makes sense. Yeah. Three books. We've got uh, the Jaws Companion, Hulk Companion, and Buck Rogers, the TV Companion. So your name checked. By the way, your name checked on page three hundred. Your thanks on page three hundred of Buck Rogers for doing what? You were friends with an actress I was hunting named Catherine Weiberg. Oh right, that I never read. Somebody <laughs> who crossed my path. Yeah, if I, if I know you, Catherine, good. I apologize, but. <laughs> I think, yeah, I tried to find who that was, and that was probably before social media, so. I know who you are, Catherine, and I love you. You were the slave girl from The Return of the Fighting 69th. You gave me great stories for the Buck Rogers book, and you will be forever in my heart, baby. Oh, and I'm sure I, I love you as well. I just don't remember who you are, so. But that's okay. That just, just sets things up. All right, so now Pat has been after me to talk about Wishmaster. So this is his turn. And so we've got, uh, we're not gonna bring the image up here, but I do have, um, uh, I, I, I do have stories about this, but I'm gonna now switch gears for all of you. And Pat is gonna ask me questions about this since I had a cameo that lasted three seconds. So I would not bring this up on my own. So this is Pat Jankowicz's ideas, ladies and gentlemen. I called her and the, my only condition for doing this show is you're gonna talk about Wishmaster and, and some other stuff. All I'm right, gonna... well, let me introduce it for people who don't know. Um, Wishmaster is a feature film that was done in 1997 that was directed by Robert Kurtzman an executive uh, uh, produced by Wes Craven. Uh, Wes Craven, Wes Craven. Wes Craven, and its plot concerns a djinn who's a wish-granting evil genie who's released from a jewel and seeks to capture the soul of the woman who discovers him, thereby opening a portal and freeing his fellow djinn to inhabit and enslave the earth. And the film stars Andrew Devoff as the djinn and Tammy Lauren. So... For I could have given you five minutes by saying it's Nightmare on Elm Street with an evil genie, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hillary is not just in a cameo. She is one of the original victims of the Wishmaster. In ancient Egypt, she is turned into a tree, and, and her makeup is done by Nicotero, Kurtzman, and Howard. The, the, the guys, they won a bunch of Oscars. A and B, yeah. 
Yes, they, they are can be. And to me, what's really exciting is Hillary has turned into a tree and it's a whole moment of her turning towards the camera. You know what I mean? I mean, it's one of her great stories. Tell us. Okay, all right. Story. So to set this up, I was Clark Peterson's assistant. He's a producer that went on to um, produce. Oh my gosh. And I'm blanking on all of his credits because he did all them without me, but he became, <laughs> he became a working producer and is very well respected. It was my very first job in Hollywood that I got and made a lot of amazing friends uh, working there. It was a lot of our first jobs. So David Mullen was shooting doing the cinematography on these horror, a lot of these horror films, who now is a cinematographer for uh, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Kubelai Uner was there scoring all the music and he's now a big time composer. It was actually DeAndre James Allen Tools uh, professor. So DeAndre is a disciple of Kubi. Um, and so uh -huh. they're doing all this and I was still acting at the time. I just moved Hey, Hillary the actress, we're gonna go I don't, you. yeah, I, I mean, I act in my twenties and my very early thirties. And so I was like, hey, is there a role for me? This sounds like a really cool film. <laughs> And, you know, that's usually not cool to be asking your, when you're an assistant, like if there's acting jobs, I just knew, I was like, just give me a cameo, just give me, a, I begged. And so they're like, well, at the beginning of Wishmaster, it's supposed to be absolute chaos in what's, what's the year, Pat? It's, I, I'm, it's, the, it's ancient Egypt where they first released the genie. Ancient yeah. Egypt. All right. So it's in ancient Egypt and you don't know what's happening, but people are turning into stones, into glass and shattering. Um, <laughs> people are screaming. And running. Let's go. Oh Just my gosh. So yeah, that was, that was when I, when I was reading the script and it had all these featured extras that were exploding and turning into things. I wanted to be glass girl. I was like, please let me be glass and explode. Cause that would be great. I did not get glass girl. Glass girl's in the trailer because it's such a big effect. You know? It's a big event, and I knew that. I knew it, and so they said, <laughs> "No, but you can. We can give you the part of the tree." And I was like, "You don't want to be like, <laughs> like." And they're like, "No, no, it's going to be a cool tree. You're going to have special effects makeup." So the camera starts as it's it's flying down the aisle, looking at people changing things. So it starts off. So half my face is just made up normally. And then um, as I'm screaming and running, you can turn and you can see that I have then turned into the tree by the second half of me. So between me running and the camera moving around, and it's because the evil genie basically turns people, uh, he grants evil wishes. So if someone sees something horrible, he would say like, do you wish not to see this anymore? And said, yes, I wish not to see this anymore. And then their eyes would explode or, <laughs> out or something. Or, oh, you know, if they don't great. want to say that's something, their mouth would so shut. So <laughs> you don't know what happened to all of us making these horribly poor informed choices and wishes at the beginning. You just see us running <laughs> in horror. And it was my first time with prosthetics. I was so excited. It was like, uh, I, it was the biggest film set I'd ever been on. And, you know, as, as a featured extra, you know, I had been on bigger sets and lower budget films, but you know, this was the real deal. Was it painful as a to be asked to give a wooden performance? Say that again? Was it painful for you as a theater actress being asked to give a wooden performance? <laughs> Please tell Aww. that bad pun. <laughs> Thank you, David. A tree joke. Nobody. <laughs> David, nobody. I can get on you to have my back on that. I know. Thank you, David. <laughs> I knew there was somebody who'd get that joke. <laughs> no, uh, it me. was, I was so nervous. And of course, you know, it was um what it, it was so chaotic that scene there were so many of us and all these prosthetics. We were running, the camera was moving, the crew, it was and it was like, even though I was background and people knew I was Clark's assistant, so they were treating me well, which was nice, but <laughs> you know, you're still, you're still background. Which How long were you in the makeup? How long were you in the, because make can be, did your makeup. How long were you in the makeup chair for that? Uh, three or four hours. And David, I think we can show the picture now of the what we're describing. Great. So um, this is me made up for Wishmaster. <laughs> and you can see half my face. Wow. Um, that's great work by the way 
And the picture, I'm so happy that Dale Robinette, uh, who's actually a famous photographer, um, that he was, he's the one who snapped that photo. And I'm so glad I did. I'm sitting outside my trailer. Oh, you had a trailer, sure, by the way. Okay, I'm so sure it was a shared trailer for uh, the special effects. And, he, you know, wardrobe came and they put twigs in my hair and <laughs> made up one of my hands. And I, I can't ever remember exactly what I had to do. How many days did it take to shoot that, Hillary? It's a big action sequence. So at least two, right? I was there, I think, just one, one or two days. Yeah. Wow. Wow, that's great. Look at that work. That's fantastic. You know? I actually have that picture framed in my home and it's, oh. but people always, yeah, at first they're always like, what happened? It looked like an, a bad burn picture. Like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, no offense, they can't be. It does look great. I mean, giving you that the, 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 the whole two-faced prosthetic, I've done prosthetics and that's a lot of work. I like that you still keep the glamour side up in the shots, but the, the gnarled side looks great too, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, so that was my 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 um, two seconds. And my dad, actually, he was in New Jersey at the time. And I was like, hey, I'm in this movie. And <laughs> so he, I thought I had explained, I am a featured extra at the beginning, <laughs> like in the first two minutes. And then he said, I had to sit through that whole damn movie then just to see your name in the end credits come up. Because <laughs> I was listed as Clark's assistant. And he was like, he was angrier that he had to sit through the movie. No offense to Wishmaster fans, but well, uh, no, we'll tell not you my dad's cup of tea. Three of them, the hell with his opinions. <laughs> he he want, likes, he's more of a comedy guy. I give him, um, you know, he's into dad jokes and like Airplane is his favorite movie if if that okay. gives you a hint, his, yeah, his taste. Well, so Airplane's good. Air, Airplane's still fairly uh, innovative, you know what I mean? Airplane's so, a great movie. It's do, no do wish. you know the, 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 uh, the hidden thing in the credits of Air, Airplane? What? So, and, and you, know, you guys know more than me. There's Best Boy. The Best Boy is a thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They have, in Airplane, they have Worst Boy, Adolf Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> You know That's the, funny. the, the great amazing movie. thing That's about great. that movie is that you can watch it in, again with a lot of the stuff, a lot of the Zucker Abrams and Zucker movies. I mean, my brother had a uh, naked gun on the other day, and you, you just so many jokes, so many smart, smart jokes they just throw so, away, you know. So good. I love jokey credits. Like, I think The Simpsons, the first, I remember the first time they did jokey credits in The Simpsons for the Halloween episode and made everyone spooky and scary. And now it's like, it's it's done. But I I remember thinking how great that was. Wow. All right, why we're here, because then we still have to go to your magical space, but uh, we're going to bring up um, Girl From No, we're not going to bring up the poster yet. No, David. hold on, no, I'm asking the questions here. Oh, okay. You, you I'm just keeping an eye on the clock. When you do an interview, it's like asking a stranger to dance. And so you're the stranger <laughs> and you're dancing. So All right. what I noticed you're referred to in some of your earlier stuff as the girl from nowhere. How did you get that moniker? Uh, that was from my solo show I did uh, when I moved to Los Angeles in 1996. It's actually going to be a smooth 25 years um, in two weeks. So um Oh, Rosie's watching. Thanks, Rosie. Oh, we love Rosie. <laughs> we love you, Rosie. Um, that people would say, where are you from? And I had just moved from New... Actually, I'd just come from four years of touring. So I was pretty much on the road. What were you touring? Tour. Talk about that. What were you I, I toured tour? two years with Freaky Friday and then one year with Jekyll and Hyde. These are all musicals. Uh, you did Freaky Friday. Who are you on Freaky Friday? Of course, I was Annabelle, the 13-year-old daughter, because I was tall uh -huh. to be uh -huh. the mom body, but I act like I'm 13. So I got to be 13 <laughs> for two years. Uh, mm -hmm. And this was um, this was through TheaterWorks USA, which uh, was fantastic. And that sh show was uh, written by Mary Rogers, who's Richard Rogers' daughter from Rogers and Hammerstein. Oh wow! So it was really, really great. The music was fantastic, and it was uh, Christopher Scott uh, choreographed it. And original choreography was by Christopher Ashley, who is a pretty well-known choreographer. Um, luckily, there was not a lot of dancing, uh, thank God. So it was like acting uh -huh. and singing. So it was so much fun. And we got to play like the Kennedy Center and the Promenade off Broadway. 
and we lived in a in a van for three years well two years for freaky friday one year jekyll and hyde and then i got cast with the national theater of the deaf and it was like oh do i want to live on the road for one more year and it was like oh yes i do this it was a year that changed my life so um so when that was over i i, I was based out of new york at the time which i had been for five or six years and then moved to LA. But before that, I had lived in Atlanta for eight years. So I considered that sort of when I was in New York, people say, where are you from? I'd be like Atlanta. But I grew up in Chicago for eight years, my formative years. So I kind of feel like I'm from from Chicago, but I wasn't born there. So it was like turned in this long story. And when I moved to LA, I was so upside down and backwards. I would journal every morning, like, what did I do with my life? Why am I here? Uh -huh. What am I doing? And this journal, yeah, it started off with how do I answer this question in a witty way? Where am I from? And then I just started joking and saying, oh, I'm the girl from nowhere. That the fact that I've moved 33 times in my life before I was 30. And I quantified that. Uh, we can bring up the uh, poster now, David. So I quantified that this move, and this was done in, oh, I, would, I don't have the year. I'm gonna say in no, 99. Let, let, let me ask you, since we're covering Girl From Nowhere. By the way, when you did Jekyll and Hyde, there's like three women roles in that. Which one were you? There's, there's like the chambermaid, there's the, the bar waitress, and then you know the people Hyde is killing. I have to say, uh, I cheated. Uh, Jekyll and Hyde, Theater Works USA is the Marta Crane, David Kaufman version. Wow. So, uh, and the reason I took the show is because Jekyll and Hyde, the one you're referring to, was on Broadway at the time. And I said, hey, I can put Jekyll and Hyde on my resume because it's legit a credit. And if people don't look at the production company and don't know, uh, I could sort of let that slide and, uh, you know, you got to do what you can in this business to get <laughs> one foot up. So it well, wasn't being honestly, I'm impressed. I'm, you know, it's like if someone asked, like now I don't care, but, you know, so it was, a th but the Theater Works USA, Jekyll and Hyde was written by Marta Crane and David Kaufman from Friends. And they also, did a great, oh, yeah, they also did a great John Landis TV show before that, you know. They were fantastic. And the show was this really great anti-drug show without being anti-drug. It's like we had a nerdy kid that he took, uh, he was a chemist in his basement and he, he wanted the girl and he couldn't get her. And so he took this chemical that he created called more. And the thing about more is, he, you know, he turned in the cool like fawns with a leather jacket <laughs> sort of dude. And then so when it wore off, he was- I was gonna that? say, Jerry Lewis, right? No, Jerry Lewis and Litter, of course, Andy Murphy, but <laughs> yeah. So, and then it got nerdier, but then he had to take more and more and more to be cool until, but then his temper started getting out of control and he was out of control until he finally breaks down and was like, I need some help. This isn't working. So it was a great metaphor show for anti and the music was so good. <laughs> it was a really, really, I was very proud of that show, even though it was not the Broadway Jekyll and Hyde, it was. Uh, it was a great show. Now, you were born in Arizona. I was born in Phoenix, but only lived there six months, according to my mom, or nine months, according to my dad. Uh, so I was, <laughs> never, I was uh, never vertical in Phoenix, so. <laughs> now, Steven Spielberg, this is what's known in the biz as a segue, kids. Steven Spielberg was also born in Arizona, and you wound up on Steven Spielberg's reality show, On the Lot. Talk about that. That's one of your greatest stories. I did, but I think we should talk about this in our magical set. All of our guests get to choose what magical place that they want to have a conversation. So, of course, Pat Jankowicz decided he wanted to go to 1980s heavy metal hellscape. So, David, let's go to... Uh, there we go. This is where you go if you want to meet Ronnie James Dio, gang. <laughs> there we go. I'm so, thank you, David. I knew you were cool. <laughs> David's beyond cool. David is way cool. His hair matches the hellscape, by the way. It works. <laughs> it so works. The fun thing about heavy metal hell, and by the way, Sister Rita Jean told me I'd get here eventually in the fifth grade. So here you right. are. <laughs> Let me ask you, because you did you did Steven Spielberg's On the Lot. You were I one did. of the chosen few handpicked by the man himself to be on the show. I was. 
Now, reality show contestants, they always have a game. They always have a system. They always have something. You have a great story. You told me in Rosie's beautiful backyard. Well, uh, you told me this amazing story on how you gamed your way on the lot. Let's hear it. I did not game my way on the lot. Um, I had, um, I was working at the time as a segment producer for a bunch of reality TV shows. And so I, when, when the, I saw the casting notice go out, Steven Spielberg and Mark Burnett are looking for the next great director, please submit a short film. And I was like, okay, and to upload it. And uh, then, but the casting director was actively scouting and said, I will be at this event on this date at this time in Beverly Hills. And this is back in the DVD days. So I think it was 2007, I still had and I always carry DVDs in my car. Even to this day, I carry DVDs just in case this exact situation happens where uh, she was like, please give us your short films up to five minutes. So I was like, oh, I'm not going to send it. And I'm going to hand it to you. And I said, here's my short, you know, I'd love to be on the show. But then it was one of those uh, things where you had to upload it and you try to get your friends to vote for you. And it's a great marketing trick to try to get an audience before the show actually happens. And I was like, I'm not going to play that game. Wow. You know, I've got other things going on. You have my short. If you want to, if you want to call me, call me, but I, I'm not one of those influencers, as you can see by the three people watching. Oh, <laughs> hey, it's not the quality. It's the quality. True. If Rosie's one it's of them, we've got a pretty hell of a good three people. I don't even know if she's watching. She, I saw okay. uh, on my phone that uh, Rosie commented on, um, my Facebook photo. So, well, God love her. <laughs> We're going to send her the link, anyways. We love And you, it's really. going to go on my book pages. So, there will be good people watching this. And if you bought uh, my book, people watching, I appreciate you. <laughs> we appreciate We appreciate you supporting the arts, especially nowadays. We need that. Keep Pat in coffee. Thank you. Oh, my God. The coffee's fantastic, by the way, in the green room. <laughs> so, my compliments to the crafty girl. Crafty is on it. Crafty is there on we it. Go. So, and so. Yeah, so they called me and said, well, you've moved to the next round. I said, that's impossible. I never did the online, you know, rah, rah, rah for my film and sending it out. And they said, yeah, well, that's the marketing department. This is the casting department. Wow. And I moved up. Um, so then I had to send in more paperwork. And then when they uh, they narrowed it down and said, okay, we have the final 200 directors out of 12,000. And you have five days to make a short film with, uh, we're not giving you any money. You cannot use Spielberg or Burnett's name or DreamWorks. Wow. You have to do it and they gave us log lines. And so I did ditto in five days. I wrote, direct, produced, edited, and delivered um, that. And that's what got me on the show. What was your log line? What, what log line did they give you? Because I always like- It was a week, it was a premise more than a log line, but they said premise. something important gets lost. Okay, smart. And you made that great short. And the two shorts you made during this show, you did you did Ditto, which is fantastic, and Snips and Snails, which is also great. Snips and Snails was the very first submission. That's what got them- That's what got you put in the door. But Ditto, which is really clever- That was, sailed was the, the deal. One. You did it on their premise and write for them. Correct. I think that's really exciting. When did you when did you full blown out of the brow of Zeus? When did you decide what Ditto was going to be? I told the story on the other show, but uh, for you, oh, Pat. I wasn't even asking the questions then. <laughs> now you're in the hands of a master interviewer, baby. <laughs> All right, this brings it full circle back to Clark Peterson at Image Organization. When I was working there, Pierre David. Uh, who was an executive producer of, so thriller, of producer. Wishmaster. I'd be, I'd be remiss if I didn't oh, mention else who did Hold on, here. wait, no, no, no. I am, I see, I'm merging these jobs. Erase that. See, we're not editing. This is a live show. This was actually my last day job I had. I was an assistant to, um, um, uh, to an attorney at, Peter Laird, Edelstein Laird, and Sobel, and Jerry Edelstein was the senior uh, attorney, and he had a cup in the kitchen that had ditto on it, and when I got my tour of 
um, this law firm on the first day, they said, oh, and here's the kitchen, help yourself to any plates, dishes, cups, but don't touch the ditto cup. Wow. And I said, why, what does it mean? And I said, nobody knows. <laughs> wow. So, uh, so from there, I thought about it, thought about it. And I talked to, uh, I was dating a writer at the time. And so he was the one who came up with the idea for, he's like, oh, this has got to be like a rosebud thing where the it means- stories something. come from real life. Oh yeah. And actually when I did the shoot, I went back um, because my hairdresser worked in the same building. I said, like, you know, by the way, how Hollywood, huh? Lawyer, hairdresser. <laughs> oh my God. So I actually, I would pop in, I'd pop back in to say, hi, I'm producing now. And it was, it was fun to be able to see the old gang again. And I said, Jerry, I have a very bizarre question, but I'm doing a short film and I need to borrow your ditto cup. Now wow. you, can, you can imagine this, <laughs> which, which actually was because he could never say I love you back because he's this, you know, New York Jew, that, like that, I don't show emotions. You just know, you know. So his new wife, who's beautiful and um, charming, she would be like, Jerry, I love you. And he wouldn't, you know, he's never, he's not the touchy feely type. He'd be like, ah, oh, did I? a lawyer, so it's probably secondary. <laughs> it's Jerry Patrick Swayze said, and ghosts. Patrick Swayze and Ghost. I was thinking of Ghost as right. well. Which he didn't say I love you. Yeah. He said ditto. And that's how he, that's yeah, how he knew exactly. Whoopi Goldberg was telling the truth. So she, um, Antoinette, uh, actually gave him the ditto cup that she made saying, you know, because it was their little inside joke. And that's what I based the film on. So he said, okay, um, we borrowed it to make a replica. So I had a props guy. I, I, and now it's like, dude, you really didn't have to do that. You could have made and painted any cup, but we made a replica I, for the integrity of the film. <laughs> I we actually painted the oh, I integrity. I love this part. <laughs> where yeah, and it was a prop cup that we could throw and drill and do all for the special for the throw across. So yeah, and then should, when we should showed, we switch to our other hellscape for a bit? Oh yeah, let's switch. Thank you, David. Hellscape two. This feels oh, more like an fire was a little warm. warm. Yeah. You know, it's more dragony, it's more 13-year-old girl. The last one was more 13-year-old boy. That's the perfect hellscape. This one's comfortable. Oh my God. <laughs> Good heavens. Uh, um, but this one is more, and then now your red hair goes along well with this. It really one. works with that, right? Yeah, and yours too, does Don't too. Don't make me angry. Well. And there you go. Oh. Don't make me angry. Ah. You don't like me when I'm angry. No. Very nice. But the, uh, the, the great thing about, well, first of all, heavy metal hell. You love, you look at going back to like old Kiss album covers. The hell on the hill with all the fire. That's always, the, the, you notice that every hell cover you ever had, Ronnie James Dio and everything else, the hell version of hell and the mountains of hell always look more interesting than the upfront hell on the album cover. You ever notice that? You know, if you're, if you're last in line or any of the other metal songs and albums, there would always be like a smoky hidden hell up on the mountain. And that always looked like the hell you wanted to go to as a kid. <laughs> I thought, boy, I'd have to walk up there. I'm not sure how long I'd last, but you know, you'd be disappointed if there weren't like super demons up there. <laughs> well, this, David, David has wings and skeletons oh, as well. He, he, we there you go. go. Very nice, David. <laughs> yeah, we got the full effect. I fan. I love the skeletons. <laughs> we haven't had the skeleton. I know we're gonna have so much fun at Halloween. You'll have to come back for Halloween. We'll wow, what did we do for your Halloween show last year? Uh, well, Hanging with Hillary has only been on since uh, January, so we have Oh, had I'm sorry. Okay. Wow, wow, wow. But when, one thing with you, Hillary, when it was sort of interesting, you're always very prim and proper, but I love the episode. It was like a warm-up episode where your sister, Rachel, interviewed you, and everything that came out of her mouth surprised you, and you were just... You couldn't keep up with her. It was really charming. No, I can't. Yeah, Rachel is fantastic. She's in Indiana. And um, yeah, Rachel actually has this incredible business, the Who's Your Trainers? Who's Your Trainer? Who's Your Trainer? Uh, yes. Tell her it's corny and un, 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 it doesn't uh, work. It wor totally works. Uh, I'm naming so her business as well. <laughs> So we've had a pivot, you know, she had a pivot like everybody else in the pandemic and started to move her training business 
online. And so she was able to work me out all summer long, which I really appreciate. I love you, Rachel. So we did, we did an online version of that, that Pat is referring to, which I don't, I think we did it live. I think it was the Facebook. Yeah, I thought you posted it. I, I saw it on a post when your show was starting up. And it was just funny to watch her mess with you. I mean, she was doing all sorts of, of joy, you know. So let me ask you this. When did you transition from actress to director? When I started producing reality TV, because I knew that you can't be producing a TV show and then be like, oh guys, I gotta go run out to this audition now. That just does not fly. Your hours are insane. And I was starting to get work. And for me, the acting roles I was going out for were just horrible. And that's why I did Girl From Nowhere is because I was like, where's my craft? Where's my story? Where's, uh, Girl From Nowhere was a show that I wrote and produced. And I could, I guess, directed as well. I would film myself doing the show and then uh, watch myself back and give myself notes. <laughs> and then what, you performed it. Uh, no, the, did your mom and dad and sisters come? I had once, it was, it was a busy time. And at the time, it didn't feel like that big of a deal. And it, for me, it was, it was personal and it was risky where I, it started off as a geographical journey, but the show is really about what the meaning of home is and an artistic journey. As you can see with Hanging with Hillary, I mean, it's just, I, it's something I've embraced because I feel like I've always been unorthodox and not just my Jewish upbringing, but I just have always been a round peg in a square hole and a little bit of an outlier and not intentionally, trust me, I have wanted you know, to be mainstream. And I just veered to the left and into different dimensions. And I finally stopped I fighting. Relate. I, you know, and it was like, I'd be up for these shows and be like, are you, I, it would just bleed through, I guess, this, the fact that I was not an ingenue and I'm quirky, but not quirky enough to be a character actor. Um, so it was like, I, I, I worked, but not as much as I need to or want to, but the best credit besides Wishmaster, I actually, one of the last gigs I got was I was cast in a commercial directed by Errol Morris. Wow. He's an award-winning documentarian who did uh, The Thin Blue Line. Line. Yeah, he's, who was incredible. And he had just won his Oscar. I was like, what are you doing here? He's like eating, I, you know, I, I, I direct commercials so I can do documentaries. So it was a banking commercial. And I, that was the only other time I went back to Arizona. So I'm like, I'm vertical in Arizona now. Wow. <laughs> and uh, I had never been flown anywhere to act. And I was Martha the bank teller. I think I've got it <laughs> somewhere. And he loved my quirky behavior, but he filmed, I'm not exaggerating, like 80 takes. And I'm glad that there was another guy who went before me because I'm watching him going again, but bigger. And he's rolling and he shot this on film. <laughs> hours and hours of like one line and okay, do it this way. And then he'd go again, again. Okay, now do it quiet. Okay, now do it crazy. Now do it this. And he was freaking out and I was watching and I was like, oh no, this is, I can see he wants choices, many, 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 many choices. And then when it was like, he was like, I must suck because I didn't get that. Like it took an hour to get my line. And I was like, no, this is the way he works. So and then when I got there, I could let go of that insecurity, which I would have been freaking out also. And wow. I just laid, oh my gosh, it's like, that's an actor's dream for me. It's like, I get to do it a hundred times. Well, they're all Morris, no less. Oh, it was so great. And I think I I have the dailies also somewhere and you can hear him getting so excited. And he, a couple of times he bumps the camera because he was jumping up and down too much. But isn't that great when you, when you get a, when my first commercial was with David Lynch and it was just, it's really exciting. It was really exciting because you're, you, you know, when you're there, you don't want to look bad in front of Errol Morris, but Right. You want to please him, but you already watched the other guy sweat through a hundred takes, you know? 
Oh yeah. And I knew, yeah. But well, then when he was doing it to me, I was, I was just able to play along. So it wow. was fun. It was so fun. And then we got a call and the money was great. It was oh, like one of the biggest commercials I'd done. I did a Jack in the Box commercial as well. You did? Hold on. What, what, I did Burger King. I, I did Burger King and Carl's Jr. I never did Jack in the Box. You know, what did you do on Jack in the Box? Were you the girl or you were the, the customer? Uh, they cut out all of it. It was some creative guy's idea to do like Jack was running for president and kissing babies and he <laughs> wanted to be PC and have a sign language interpreter. And, you know, I know sign language. And so they said, except we don't want real interpreting. Oh no, they wanted an interpreter. And then they wanted next to the interpreter, a Jack interpreter where they had on a, um, on a hand of like a mouth like this and they put a Jack head on top and they like put two oh. eyes. And it was like, cause Jack needed his own interpreter for the jacket. It was like a horrible joke. And so for me, for interpreting, and they said, hey, can we have an inside joke for the deaf people? I said, well, that's not really how interpreting works. Uh, but they said, instead of signing Jack's speech, can you just sign, he has a really big head. And I was like, <laughs> that's funny. I think you have to double caption that. And it was, the whole thing was weird and they, <laughs> thank god somebody was like this is terrible please take out all the sign language things that were hilarious in the marketing meeting but and so they the campaign ran of just jack running for president kissing babies that was my jack in the box and i and i do have a polaroid picture of that somewhere do you really, that, that would have been good if you had had it ready at the beginning of the hour young lady <laughs> Tech you rehearsal, got ready, i gotta know what to prep for <laughs> we have very elaborate texts here, David and I. Yes. When I did when I did my Jack in the Box commercial, they put me on a girder 40 feet up above the Vanda Camps. They were they were gutting Vanda Camp at the time. And the, the, the Vanda Camp bakery, which is now LA Unified, but they kept the sign up and everything. We're on a girder, and the stunt coordinator goes, Okay, I got your stunt harnesses on. And I kept saying the guy playing the other construction worker and you know, uh, the Burger King would come by and he would make off color jokes. He'd swing by in another girder and he'd make jokes to us every time he swung by. He started out doing Darth Vader jokes. Then, you know, it was the greatest commercial because they were literally paying me to bite into Whoppers. It was the dream job. Is this- Did you is, have the spit bucket where you have to spit? That's the hilarious thing. <laughs> the, the guy I'm doing the the guy I'm doing the spit bucket thing with, he's filling his up. Mine is empty. Because you're they, eating it. Oh, Pat! Like, they're giving Were me you so sick. I did a Beethoven movie, and the same thing happened there. Me and the dog were the only ones. Charles Grodin and all these other uh, Charles Grodin and Mari Chankin are spitting in their bucket. Me and the dogs were the only ones with the empty spit buckets because oh. we never used them. <laughs> They, they say that Chris Pratt, I've heard that Chris Pratt, one of the things about him is he never uses his, his spit bucket. So if you're watching P Parks and Rec or something like that, and you see Chris Pratt take a bite of a burger, he ate 30 burgers that day. By oh. the way, God bless him. He's a, he's another tall gentleman. I love him. My cousin Todd lives by, my cousin Todd lives in Seattle by his mom. And, and it's like, if they're paying you to eat Whoppers, I'm eating a Whopper. And <laughs> this is, this is my, my worst Hollywood moment. Uh, they come up and the, the creatives are going, you know, they're, they're giving the notes and they go, could you ask Pat to admire the burger like this? You know, they're pantomiming because they go in his hands, the Whopper looks like the 99 cent Whopper Junior. <laughs> I, I was crying all the way home. And, they, and so I'm, I'm admiring it when Burger King is offering us the burger. And at the end of the day, We've been up on like four or five hours and we've been 40 feet in the air over over the Vandekamp Bakery wreckage, these giant rebars shooting straight into the air. And I said, well, since we're all harnessed up, I go, we ought to just jump up and be like a free bungee jump. And he goes, we want to look professional, Pat. The creatives are here. Oh my gosh. So, and a reminder that Pat is 6'9", so anything in his hands is going to look teeny <laughs> David, so, let's let's head on to the dive bar. Wait, wait, wait let me go. Yes, this is the 35 in Pasadena. There we go. I'm drinking my eyes on.
So the punchline is at the end of the day, I Wait, can't hold on a second. David, where'd you go? Hold on, I'll, I'll, I'll fix it. Don't worry. Straight. Okay, David's up in the TV, everyone. Yeah, but that'll be three, there we go. Three. There is. <laughs> I asked for the scotch, David. Scotch and water. I don't think Hillary takes water. <laughs> he he is he is our yeah he's in the he's on TV in the bar which I love. I've always wanted oh, to be on TV. Did. You're totally on TV, David. <laughs> so the punchline is end of the day. My friend, the other guy on the girder, tells me it looks unprofessional. Stunt coordinator comes up and he goes. I'm so glad you guys, you know, didn't slip or anything. He goes, I didn't have time to, to tie up your harnesses. So yeah, so if I jumped off, oh, I would fall Oh God, oh. Pat. It was a bad afternoon after that. That's My a bad afternoon, afternoon, yes. So you didn't tell one of my favorite stories. You went to Sam French after booking the Spielberg reality show. Yes. <laughs> Tell that story. Come on, you're 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 coming. Uh, okay. Story. So, all right. So, I'd been a segment producer, and I can't believe this. Like 2000s, my 15 minutes of fame is getting stretched out way, way, way past. That up and tell it. <laughs> so, um, so I've been a segment producer, and now I was up to be actually on a reality show, and I see this book of. Uh, how to survive being on a reality show at the Samuel French bookstore in Hollywood on Sunset Boulevard, which has all sorts of fantastic plays and uh, scripts and things related to uh, filmmaking and television and theater. So it's a great bookstore, support Sam French. Now it's a publisher. So anyways, they have this book of how to get on and survive reality television. And uh, I got this book and it was giving lots of good ideas such as um, don't drink all the al alcohol that's offered to you, but that's more for like the bachelorette and the hot tub shows, the real world going way back a bit. And the best piece of advice I got from the book, which served me very well, not just on the show, but in life to say, if they're trying to goad you into an answer or to being snarky, because you know, reality shows are made in the mm -hmm. editing room, which everyone knows now, but back in the day, you'd get a lot of unsuspecting, naive, pe drunk people talking and crying and making out and doing whatever. And then the editors would have a field day and craft whatever story they wanted out of thousands of hours of footage. So, uh, so for me, there was a moment when, right when we got one of our challenges where Carrie Fisher was like, you have until eight o'clock tomorrow morning to come up with a, with a pitch and the log lines are under your chair, but you have to practice your pitch in front of one of the contestants on camera. That was part of the instruction so they can they could get footage of us practicing our pitch. So it's it's late at night and I pull um, my log line, which I can't remember at the moment, from uh, from under my chair. And they're like, all right, everyone go out into the ballroom because we were at the Biltmore Hotel downtown LA, which is gorgeous. And I'm thinking about it. And no more than five minutes after we're walking out, one of the directors hops in front of me and says, okay, you want to practice our log lines? And of course a camera crew swings around. <laughs> and I was like, I just got this. I'm not quite ready yet. Check back with me later. They're like, okay. Then they were all excited. Like, oh, it's a potential drama. We can build it that you're foes and you don't want to pitch to this guy because it's going to steal your idea. I mean, they, I could see that the producers had on me. was like, <laughs> I know what you're doing. You're, you're oh. concocting drama that doesn't exist and I'm not going to play into this. So they pulled me into a sequestered area for an interview. And I knew it's like, I have been you. I have goaded people into saying things in interviews that you need to get for reality TV, which is why I don't do reality TV anymore. And you blow your own sound bites. I, I did not answer their questions because you cannot control the questions, but you can control your answers. Wow. So I would be like, you know, he, he is a great director. He is, uh, <laughs> you know, working out and wants to get things in. They're like, yeah, but wasn't he a little rude when he just jumped in front of you? And I said, 
I love when directors are really enthusiastic and eager. And I wouldn't anything they can work with. Not, and you could see they you could see they were getting frustrated, like, oh, why doesn't she know what we want? I was like, oh, I know what you want, but I'm not mm. gonna give it to you. <laughs> so to this day, I'm like, okay, I'm I'm glad I got to save my integrity. Although I wonder if that played into me not. I did move on that night to the next level and two more levels past that. But I'm wondering if they did be like, oh, that girl won't play into our dirty drama games. I was like, I would rather be known for my work than my yeah. antics on set. And you don't know how big a show is when you're on it because they take away all they take away your all your electronics. So you don't have content with the outside world of if there's controversy, you have no idea what's going on. You're flying in the dark. Yeah, but I think that protected you a little bit. I, I was on an edition with a, a, some guy from Average Joe. And we were on the back lot and Teamsters were walking by calling him an a-hole. And I couldn't figure out why. I go, I go, how do they all know you? And he goes, I did a reality show for the money and they made me the heel. And he goes, and I oh, played yeah. along with it. But this is like three years after whatever the show was. Yeah, and it's got yeah. a long life. My attorney <laughs> tried to talk me out of doing the show because the contract was, you know, a massive, basically saying we can destroy your life and you could die and there's nothing you can do. Wow. So, and I was like, you know, uh, I think it's, I'm glad I did it and I'm glad that nothing bad happened, but she was doing her job trying to protect her client from potential. She goes, you're going to have a long career and let's not have any of this bag. So, so she goes, you go on. And if you have to get cut for being nice, have that happen and have your work. Wow. Done. Smart woman. And by the way, by the way, did it haunt you? Was there a bounce to it? Did, tell us about that. Because that No, was... I actually had probably the best experience um, from the show. It was really, really hard, I think, on the younger contestants who because they pumped us up with so much. And I, I've been part of shows that I've watched contestants do this where they're like Spielberg handpicked you. I'm like, no, he didn't. But that, I use that in my bio because I'm like, well, uh -huh. you use that in but your- You probably should edit that part out. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't think he watched any. And they're like, no, seriously, you watched all your films. I'm like, maybe, but you know. And so they pump you up of like every interview. This can be your, you know, your career moment where you, if you, cause the prize was a million dollars by the time after taxes is probably 500,000, but still that's a chunk of change. And for me, the, it was also a year on the lot. You got a bungalow on the DreamWorks lot. Oh, wow. Which is an open door to take meetings. And that to me was worth just as much, if not more than the money. Now tell us what happened to the winner because this is one of the it's considered one of the most horrific punchlines in, in reality show history. I have to leave uh, you in the box minute. I'll be right. I'll be right back. Someone's at my door, but you guys continue. Okay. All right. So we'll listen for gunshots. I believe it was Will who actually really wanted to be an actor. I think I think he may have done something or he tried to take meetings, but uh, he was also pursuing an acting career at the same time, which was frustrating for a handful of us who truly, you know, want to get content made and not just get cast and things. So I'm not really sure. I didn't, I didn't get to talk to him. Now tell me, and what should every director know? In general, in life? Yeah, and in general, what is the most important things you need to know going on a set every day, Hillary? Oh my gosh, prepare, prepare, prepare. You cannot be prepared enough and you need to have a plan A, B, C, D, and E. You need to know your, your script, your characters, your day, your shot list, uh, that you've done your homework because inevitably, invariably, then you can let that go and be in the moment to see what happens. Like even like for this show, this little, you know, silly live stream that I prep for it. And then I'm relaxed and be like, well, the conversation can go where it goes and we can still do what needs to be done. Or for a show, if you're directing, you need to make your day, you need to 
for me, it's important that everyone is happy or as happy as can be. Um, and I am a stickler for call times, as you know that. Well, and I'm also, I also question if I see an actor is going to be sitting in their trailer or is called to set too early. I'm very cognizant because I remember those days where you're sitting and you're waiting and it's like you're ready to go. And if you have that standby energy for hours and you're not, a, you know, it, it, it can drain you. So mm -hmm. I feel like it's the same thing where if you're in the master, you can, you can say, okay, we're not going to use that moment where you break down or you go crazy. So go at 60% and save it for the shot where I know. And so it's just communicating with your talent and your crew and to, to be able to know what your day is, to be able to communicate your vision to not just the actors, but the crew and everyone around you. And then to embrace people's artistic process. Everyone works differently. Um, different people have different needs and different needs on different days. So it's being intuitive and seeing, okay, this person wants a lot of rehearsal and this person's just like, show me my marks and let me go. Uh, so it's, it's really being in tune to other human beings who just want to do the best they can and there's some people who are there just because it's a job and that's okay too it's like there's some incredible crafts people uh who love what they do and are good at it but at the end of the day it's a job to them and they they need to be treated with respect and hopefully there's something in there that inspires people to do their best to be a little creative to try something maybe that they haven't had a chance to try before. And so that's what I think. No, do you ever feel as a woman on set, do you ever feel challenged by some crew guys or is it just, you know what I mean? Do you, do I, you have, ever feel I absolutely have. I think things are changing now where people are a little more woke and I try to surround myself with people who respect me and that I respect them back. It's it's hard enough to make a movie and to deal with all the juggling parts. You're responsible for a lot of things and a lot of people and to have any of that toxic energy is is exhausting and it's it's for me it's it's stealing focus and the set I like my sets to be happy and it's up to me to set the tone from the table read of this is how I work I'm open I think people get that pretty quickly that I'm a collaborative person I like hearing ideas but then after a while you know we have to make our day and we can't the discussions are limited then and you just need you need to make your day and need to get the most incredible performances that you can and at the end of the day it's about the project it's about the script it's about the film it's about the message and it's about treating people along the way with kindness and respect Quentin Tarantino said a director's career lasts as long as their legs is that really the hardest part about directing you know Talk about that. I don't know about that. We're, and I'm checking the time here because we're going to have to go head back to the talk show set in a moment. I, that's so cool when you're wearing your producer hat. And uh, we haven't oh, heard from David. I hope it wasn't a bunch of drug lords murdering him at the wrong house. No, yeah, it was oh. you know, a oh, delivery, God, delivery from my neighbor. <laughs> oh, wink, wink. <laughs> Is it a bag? Is it triple wrapped? <laughs> don't open it. I've seen that movie. Oh. No, so, when the neighbor of the Colombian gets back, uh, give him our best. It was 420 <laughs> yesterday. Just the pizza. <laughs> Just the pizza. Oops. Looks like we need another pizza. Um, yes, wear comfortable shoes because you're on your feet and absolutely get in shape. Um, we need to wrap this up. So let's go back to our talk show set and thank Pat Dankowitz for being on the show. Thank you so much for being here. Please subscribe, forward this to friends. And uh, we love comments, we love feedback. So uh, I appreciate you hanging with me. Thank you, Pat and David, as always. Thank you for being a fabulous co-host. Great job, David. Great thank job. This was fun this week. This oh, it's always you. fun. It's always fun. Oh. Always fun. So, so I'm gonna view of the two of you. It's kind of exciting. Thank you.
you mortals, bow down. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next Wednesday on Hanging with Hillary. Thanks for hanging with me. Come on, Dee Dee, we're out of here. Wow, look at that. We got my mortals. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>